Welcome back to the Illumination Lectures, and today we're going to be looking at the New Testament Saul, or St. Paul. I call him Saul throughout my, uh, throughout my books because Paul is his adopted title, and it means small or junior, uh, probably because he was the youngest of the apostles. And that's important in this research because his status amongst the apostles um, will become important later in this talk. But why discuss Saul? I mean, he's not very important, is he, within the Gospel story? You don't hear about him very much in lectures, in, in church, or in theology. Uh, well, actually, that's, that's not correct, really, because Saul is pivotal to this story, because he wrote much of the New Testament. He wrote all of the epistles, for a start, the letters, which form the bulk of the New Testament. And he probably wrote Luke and Acts of the Apostles as well. And he also created Christianity, as we will see later. Christianity was not the Church of Jesus, it was the Church of Saul. And we know this in part because Jesus was a Nazarene Galilean Jew. He was a revolutionary, he was a fundamentalist. As Jesus said, not one jot or tittle of the law of Mosaic law, of course, uh, will be changed. So, so he was a proper Jew. Conversely, Saul was a Romophile. He was semi-Gentile. He didn't agree with circumcision. He didn't agree with kosher regulations. Um, he was a very different character to Jesus. Saul was br brought up as an Nazarene Jew, of course, but he changed his mind uh, on his evangelical travels around the Mediterranean. And we'll come on to those in a minute. As Saul said um, of his new church that he made, before faith came, we were confined under the law of Moses, restrained until faith was revealed. But now that faith, in Jesus of course, has come, we are no longer a custodian of Mosaic law. Galatians 3.23 um, So, in this statement, Saul is diverging from Mosaic law, from the law of, of Orthodox Jews, of the Nazarene Jews, and forming his own um, belief system, his own church, his own religion. So, Saul rejected Mosaic law. He became an apostle to the Gentiles, as it says in um, Romans 11.13. Uh, but um, the Gentiles he was preaching to didn't want to change everything in their life. And they certainly didn't want to be circumcised as an adult. So Saul went to James, that's uh, the brother of Jesus, for a dispensation to teach Judaism uh, to the Gentiles, but without all of the Mosaic law and kosher regulations. And surprisingly, very surprisingly, I think, actually, James agreed. And he gave four very simple rules for these new Gentile Jews um, to follow. And James said that they should abstain from sacrificed, um, abstain from animals sacrificed to idols, uh, abstain from blood, abstain from strangled animals, and from fornication, which I think he means, um, I think he means incest by that. And then he says, fare thee well. That comes from Acts um, 15.28. So, by this, by going to James, by getting these new regulations, Saul had done away with all of Mosaic law. He had just ripped out the heart of traditional Judaism. He had formed a new church, a new religion. Um, the Church of Saul. Uh, I call it simple Judaism, or Judaism for Gentiles. But in the modern world, we call it Christianity. And um, this new church was, uh, it was 
a Gentile Jew church. It became a very successful church um, after Saul went on his evangelical missions around the Mediterranean. It became a very successful church. It became an opposition church to the church of Jesus and James. And it became a very critical church as well. Critical of many of the traditional regulations held by Orthodox Judaism and by the Nazarene Judaism of Jesus and James. Um, for instance, not being kosher. And here is an example. This is um, talking about uh, St. Peter when he was in Antioch with Saul. So St. Peter had gone up from Jerusalem. He'd gone up to Antioch, which is uh, up in effectively Syria, really. And, and he was staying with Saul up in Antioch. And it observes of St. Peter. It says, before the apostles came from James, Peter did eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. That's Galatians 2.12. Fearing. Well, he was fearing the church of Jesus and James. And, and note, well, because they were uh, traditional Jews and they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't approve of St. Peter uh, being non-kosher. And note that this verse calls the church of um, Jesus and James the church of the circumcision. The battle lines have already been drawn between traditional Nazarene Judaism and simple Judaism. And those battle lines revolved around the typical disputes we have of circumcision and kosher food regulations, and a few others, but they were the main two. So in this quote, St. Peter is, is being duplicitous. He's pretending to be simple Judaic, the church of Saul, and, and being non-kosher. And then when the apostles arrive from Jerusalem, He's trying to prove that he's really kosher. And Saul is unimpressed by this, and he says to Peter, If you, being a Jew, can live like the Gentiles, why do you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? Galatians 2.13. And he's quite right. Make up your mind, St. Peter. Are you in the church of Jesus and James, or are you in the church of Saul? You can see the divisions here. And remember that this theological split between Judaism and... This is not a theological split between Judaism and Christianity. This is a split between Christianity and the Church of Jesus and James. The Nazarene Church, the Galileans. There was also another split, of course, between the, the Church of Jesus and James and Orthodox Judaism, the Jews who ran Jerusalem at that time. But that was another split entirely. So the seeds of sectarian disputes were being sowed. This was back in the AD 50s. And some of those um, divisions still exist today. So perhaps we can now see why Saul is so important in this story. Because he was the creator of Christianity, simple Judaism. And yet that story has been largely sidelined. You don't hear this preached from the pulpit or in your Sunday school lessons. Furthermore, the story that emerges from this is somewhat different because it becomes very political. Saul became quite powerful. His church became larger and became quite influential. It became quite powerful. And he began persecuting the church of Jesus and James. And we'll see this several times in this talk. But it's, this is uh, demonstrated quite well by the death of Stephen. And the verse says, this is from Acts uh, 7.58. It says, they cast Stephen out of the city and stoned him 
And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And there was a great persecution against the church of Jerusalem. Persecution against the Jerusalem church. That's the church of Jesus and James, the Nazarenes, the Galileans. And Saul was closely involved in that persecution. More, perhaps, than this actually says, because Professor Robert uh, Eisenman says of this event, the Stephen in Acts, that's the Stephen just mentioned in this verse, is a fictitious stand-in for the attack by Saul on James, James the brother of Jesus, which was evidently considered so embarrassing by the early church writers that it was unmentionable, but not forgotten. That was from uh, Professor Robert Eisenman in his, uh, um, his great work, James the brother of Jesus. But why does Eisenman think so? Well, this is because it says in the Clementine Recognitions, um, which give an alternative account of this same event, of um, the stoning of Stephen. And it says, in the middle of which that enemy attacked James and threw him headlong from the top of the temple steps, and supposing him to be dead, he cared not to inflict further violence upon him. That's Clementine Recognitions uh, 170. And it is widely thought that the enemy mentioned here who attacked James refers to Saul, St. Paul. So here is Saul, the, the creator of Christianity, which we've already established, trying to kill James, the brother of Jesus. Yeah, you can see, if you start looking deeper into this gospel story, a very different story emerges. It's not all peace and light within this story by any means. So why was James called Stephen in Acts of the Apostles, whereas in Recognitions he was actually named as James, but not many people know about Recognitions or have read it. It's, it's one of these alternative um, Gnostic Gospels. So why was James called Stephen in Acts of the Apostles? Well, because many of these events were embarrassing. They didn't exactly portray the, the history or the religion that the Gospels wanted to, uh, wanted to portray. So pseudonyms were made up for many of these people. And many of these were meaningful pseudonyms, so they carried an essence of who the person was. And in this case, Stephen just means crown, or thereby it means king. And James was, in fact, a king, as we will demonstrate later in a, a talk on uh, Jesus, king of Edessa. So it was merely saying that James was a king, so they just called him Stephen instead. And it was James the king who Saul was attacking in, this, uh, in these verses. So you can see the sectarian dispute be beginning here between the simple Judaism, Christianity, and the church of Jesus and James. So yes, Christianity has nothing to do with Jesus. In fact, Christianity, the church of Saul, was the enemy of the church of Jesus. And so Christians have, have, have been largely deceived by this. They are actually following a religion that persecuted Jesus, and we will see that persecution again in, an, in a minute. So in reality, the Nazarene Galilean church was persecuted by the church of Saul and it was defeated, it, was, it it's disappeared. It does not exist today. There is no Nazarene church that has roots that extend back to the first century. 
So the Nazarene Galilean church of Jesus and James disappeared. It was supplanted by the church of Saul, simple Judaism, which we know today as Christianity. So perhaps you can see here why the first lecture I did, which was the Cleopatra story, was actually a prequel to this main story. Um, but it came first because, well, chronologically it's first and also it's a more interesting story than this sort of dry look at the uh, Gospels. But you, know, you need to know this information first before you can actually see the Cleopatra to Christ story. You need to understand the links between of these characters. You need to understand the chronological chasm, which we will look at in a minute. Because unless you understand all of this basic theology, unknown theology in largely, because this is, again, as I said before, it's not preached in, in the, the pulpit and it's not given to you uh, within Sunday school. So this is the hidden basic information that underpins the gospel story. That Saul was the founder of simple Judaism which we call Christianity. But who was Saul? We still haven't answered that question really. We, we've, we've talked about Saul and, and his ideals and what he achieved, uh, but who was he in the historical record? And why is the founder of Christianity missing from the historical record? In fact, you could go further than that. You could say, why are all of these people missing from the historical record? Whether it's Adam and Eve, Abraham and Jacob, Moses and Aaron, King David and Solomon, Jesus and Saul, they're all missing from the historical record. It's as if the Bible story has been written on Mars or something. It's totally disconnected from real history. And I've said this before and I'll say it again, you've only got two options here. We're either looking in the wrong locations or we're looking in the wrong eras. And in this case, we are looking in the wrong era because of the chronological chasm. So I ask the question again, who is Saul? St. Paul. Well, I knew who Saul was the first time I read Josephus. I mean, it's so obvious. He is there the first time you read it. And this is interesting because if I can see Saul in the works of Josephus, then why can nobody else? Why has Saul not been identified in the historical record for who he really is? Well, I think he has been identified, but people will not admit it because the problems are too great in this identification. And so people just turn the page and they move on. Anyway, what I found when I read the works of, uh, of Josephus was a very, very similar character to the person we know as, as Saul. And so we have these two characters and both of them, were raised as Jews in Jerusalem. They were both Roman citizens, and that narrows it down somewhat because not many Jews in this era were Roman citizens. They were both Pharisee rabbis. They were both against the first century Jewish rebels, which shows which side of the fence they were sitting during the uh, Jewish revolt. They both had visions and changed sides. They both traveled widely. They were familiar with the royal court. They were controversial characters who were reviled by many people and stoned on many occasions. And interestingly, both of them went on a prison ship to Rome, which was sh uh, shipwrecked on Malta. And then they were both taken to Naples to see Emperor Nero. Nero. 
And they both then became, after going to Rome, both of them became authors. And the publisher of both of these characters was Epaphroditus. Interesting set of similarities between these two people. So who was this historical twin of Saul? Was he some minor character that nobody knows about, that only venerable theologians would know about? Have I found a secret text that nobody has ever seen before? No. The twin of Saul is Josephus Flavius. And that's interesting because he's such a widely known and widely read character. I mean, during the Victorian era, any educated Christian would have a Bible and the works of Josephus on the same shelf. In, pro in fact, they were probably sitting next to each other on that same shelf. And they would both be thumbed to the same degree because Josephus was the background story to the gospel story. If you wanted to know what the gospel story was about, you had to read the works of Josephus. And so all of those people who read the works of Josephus would have seen what I have seen. But why did nobody else note those similarities and say that Saul was Josephus? The answer is because of the insurmountable problems that this brings to both Christianity and Judaism. And so they saw the problems, complete horror, and they turned the page and they moved on because they didn't want to admit the problems that this will give. And those problems include the chronology, which goes all over the place. And we'll see that in a minute. This is the chronological chasm. And the character of this conflated character of Saul and Josephus, because Josephus was a traitor. He was a Jewish tra traitor who changed sides and worked for the Romans. He was a chameleon. He was a liar. He was a sycophant, a, a terrible sycophant. He was an egotist. There was only one person who was important to Josephus. And that was Josephus himself. So nobody liked this character at all. The Romans didn't like him because he was a, a bit of a religious fundamentalist and a Jewish nationalist. The Jews didn't like him, Saul Josephus, because he was a traitor who sided with the Romans. And the Christians didn't like him because he was a self-confessed liar and a cheat. But the most important problem, as far as Christianity was concerned, is that if you know who Saul was, no, let me say that again. If you know that Saul was Josephus, then you know who Jesus was in the historical record. And that's a problem, because the real Jesus is not the Jesus you might be expecting if you've just read the Gospels, or just been to Sunday school and been to church. The real Jesus is not the pauper carpenter of popular mythology. He is someone else entirely. It's the same character, it's the same story, but his status is completely different. As we saw in uh, the first lecture, yes, he was actually a king, and that changes the story completely. But there we go. We will come on to that in a minute. So a collective blind eye has been turned and a collective page has been turned and everyone has moved on. Christians, Jews, Romans, modern theologians, modern historians, they've all moved on because they saw this Pandora's box and nobody wanted to open it because they did not know where it would lead. And it challenged their beliefs. It challenged their way of life quite often. I mean, if you're a theologian, your life depends on this story. It's, it's what underpins who you are. It, what, it's what underpins your career. It's what you've learned since a baby. 
and suddenly this Pandora's box is going to change all that. You can see the resistance. You can see why people would move away from that and just turn a blind eye and carry on with life. Life's too short. Let's carry on. And so the historical Saul has been hidden for the last 2,000 years. So both Saul and Jesus do exist in the historical record. And we can find the historical Jesus if we know who the historical Saul is. Because if we know that Saul is Josephus, we get a load of extra history and text and commentary on who this biblical Jesus was. You just need to know who this biblical Jesus was in the historical record. And in the historical record, in the works of Josephus, we find that the historical Jesus was called Jesus, funnily enough, <laughs> for a man called Jesus. He was called Jesus of Gamala and Sophias, who had brothers called James and Simon, the same as the biblical Jesus did, of course. But this Jesus is no artisan. He's not a carpenter. He is the governor of Tiberias, who owned a castle in Galilee. He was the commander of 600 rebel fishermen. Now, who was the leader of rebel fishermen in the first century? I mean, this has got to be the biblical Jesus, hasn't it? The fisher of men, the, the, the leader who went out on the um, Sea of Galilee to catch fish. But of course, he wasn't catching real fish. He was catching uh, fish for his new sect because his new sect was based on the uh, constellation of Pisces, as we saw in the um, last lecture. So the army commander who was in command of 600 rebel fishermen was the biblical Jesus. And this Jesus, as told now by the works of Josephus, so now we have a history of this Jesus because we have this alternate um, we have this alternative view of who the Jesus character was. We no longer have to rely on the gospel story. We now have the historical story by Josephus himself. And he says that this Jesus, who is the real Jesus, was the rebel leader of the fourth sect, the sect of the Nazarene Galileans. And of course, if you go back to the New Testament story, Jesus was called a Galilean. Uh, that was in Luke... Um, 23.6. And he was called a Nazarene in Matthew 2.23. Uh, uh, so he was the leader of the fourth sect. And Professor Robert Eisenman says of the fourth sect, this movement, according to Josephus, led our people to destruction. As I have suggested, there can be little doubt that what he is describing here is the messianic movement in Judea. Very true. What he says is absolutely true. But is this a continuation of the messianic movement, or is this the actual messianic movement of Jesus? The reason for the confusion is the shift in the chronology, because this new Jesus, the Jesus mentioned by Josephus Flavius, was a rebel commander in the Jewish revolt in the AD 60s not the AD 30s. Now, Professor Robert Eisenman, because of the, this chronological chasm, Professor Robert Eisenman won't say that this, this messianic movement, this Jesus, was actually the biblical Jesus, because there is a 30-40 year gap between the two. So he won't say they are the same. He'll only say they are a continuation of the same rebel movement. But in reality, if we conflate these two eras and these two personalities, we suddenly find that the real Jesus was the leader of the Jewish revolt. And we'll see this time and time again in these lectures, where every bit of information we can find within the New Testament, within real history, within the works of Josephus, points back to the biblical Jesus being the leader of the Jewish revolt in the 1860s.
what's happened here is that the Romans, later after this revolt was put down, the Romans via Saul, via Josephus, created a new pacifist leader. And they moved his history back into the AD 30s to separate it off from the Jewish revolt. So how does this new association between Saul and Josephus change the story? Who is this new Saul Josephus character, this conflated character? Well, some things has to, have to change. And the first, of course, is the chronology. But we've already seen that change in the chronology several times before, back in the first lecture, back in the uh, second lecture. We've seen this change in the chronology all the time. This is the chronological chasm. And the change in the chronology comes about because Josephus was born in AD 37. Now, this is the reason why theologians have said, well, Josephus cannot be sought, because I put out this, I put out this theory 20, 25 years ago or so, uh, that Saul was Josephus. And people wrote back, of course, and said, no, you're completely wrong. Saul cannot be Josephus because he was born, sorry, jo uh, uh, yes, Saul cannot be Josephus because Josephus was born in AD 37, and that's far too late for him to be Saul. But those are, those are bold statements that are based on nothing, because there is no evidence for the birth date of Saul. There is no evidence within the, um, uh, the epistles of the age of Saul while he was on his evangelical tours. So we don't know the age or the birth date of Saul. So why couldn't he be born in AD 37? Well, in fact, he could, and we'll see why in a minute. Um, another thing we know is that this conflated character, this Saul G Josephus character, was a very precocious child because Josephus tells us so. He loves boasting about himself, of course. And Josephus, this is Saul now, um, says of himself, when I was 14 years of age, I was commended for my love of learning, on which account the high priests and principal men of the city frequently came to me in order to know my opinion about the accurate understanding of points of Mosaic law. That's Josephus' life, uh, chapter 9. Really, is this the way the world works? Yeah. Do the Oxford Dons go down to secondary schools to be taught history and law by the um, first and um, second year pupils? Does Josephus think we're stupid? Well, he's not alone in this because the Gospels say exactly the same thing. And the um, Gospels say of Jesus, after three days they found the 12-year-old Jesus in the temple sitting in the midst of the chief rabbis, listening and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Luke 2.46. Now this is portrayed as a miracle in the gospel story, as they always try to do. But again, we are being taken for fools. Because in reality, this is just simply a, a bar mitzvah celebration. In a bar mitzvah, a young boy, 12 or 14 in these cases, have to demonstrate their knowledge of the Torah to the local rabbi. But of course, if that child was important enough, perhaps he did his bar mitzvah in front of the high priest of Jerusalem. And this sort of demonstrates how well connected uh, with us and the aristocracy these particular children were. This is Josephus and um, Jesus. So the bar mitzvah, going back into the uh, chronology, the bar mitzvah of Saul Josephus, the conflated Saul Josephus, was in AD 51. Now Saul Josephus goes off uh, on his evangelical tours around the Mediterranean in AD 52. So now we know he would be 15 years old, roughly, 
as he went out on, on these tours across Anatolia and Greece. So he was young, he was 15 years old, but in Judaic terms he was a man because he had already been through his bar mitzvah. And he was being taken on these tours by his elder brother Barnabas anyway. Um, so he was in good hands. But is this not the same as Mormons do today? Exactly the same. If you get Mormons knocking on the door, you will find two kids there even, uh, evangelizing their strange religion to you. Is this not the same? Young children going, aground, uh, going out across the Mediterranean on these evangelical tours? So Saul doesn't have to have been born in AD 10 or AD 20, as, as theologians always insist, to have been a man on these evangelical tours. He could easily have been born in AD 37. And really, I think that this, this idea that Saul was born in AD 10 is just a diversionary tactic. Try and take everything away from the possibility that Saul was Josephus. Because these theologians have probably seen the possibility that Saul was Josephus. And they don't like it, of course. And so you, you have to separate these two characters by any means possible. And one of the means possible is by saying that Saul was born in AD 10, and therefore he cannot be, um, he, he cannot be Josephus. But there is no evidence for that. That, that. that is not based on fact. In reality, they were the conflated Saul, Josephus. And on these evangelical tours, when he was just 15 years old, just a lad, Saul, Josephus, was preaching Nazarene Judaism across the Mediterranean, uh, mainly to the diaspora Jew, uh, Jewish communities who, who were in that region. But he had no success at all. Um, him and Barnabas, they were laughed at, they, they were pilloried, they were stoned, they were disheartened. But I think on that tour, Saul Josephus noticed that the Gentiles were more interested in this story than the Jews. Not surprising in a way, because the Orthodox Jews have a rigid, fixed belief system, and he was trying to teach them uh, Nazarene Galilean Judaism, which was, was quite different in a way. It has, as I said before, it has this Egypto-Judaic strand to it, so it venerated the Zodiac, which went against Mosaic law for a start. So it was going to be very difficult for him to persuade the Orthodox Jews of the Mediterranean uh, to become Nazarene. However, the Gentiles were not so fixed. They were much more fluid in their belief system. They were much more persuadable. And so they wanted to join the Nazarene church because the Nazarene church was imbued with secrets. We've seen some of those secrets in the previous lecture where they knew about the heliocentric um, uh, system of, 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 of the solar system. They knew the form and shape of the earth. They knew about procession of, of the equinox. They knew many things in cosmology and mathematics. So it was quite interesting to some people. But they didn't want to become Jews. They didn't want to be circumcised. They didn't want to adhere to um, uh, kosher dietary regulations. So this is when Saul went to James to ask for a dispensation to teach to Gentiles, as we saw just a while ago. And this is when James gave Saul Josephus the four simple rules for Gentiles. And then James said to uh, the young Saul Josephus, because on his second tour he was probably only about, oh, I don't know, 17 or so, fare thee well, off you go, and sent him off on his second tour of the Mediterranean. And James was probably thinking that, you know, nothing would come of this. It was a young man with silly ideas, and anyway, off he went. But how wrong he was, because this was the birth of simple Judaism which we call Christianity. And it began in Anatolia and Greece in the mid 
AD 50s, when Saul Josephus went to the Gentiles of the region and he got adherence to his new simple Judaism. He got supporters. He grew more confident. He grew more wealthy because, of course, they brought in money to his new fledgling church. He became more powerful because he had all of these supporters, which included some fairly powerful backers for that era. And he became a challenge to the Nazarene Galilean church of Jesus and James. And challenged Jesus and James he did, as, as it says in Acts. It says, Saul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of Jesus. He went to the high priest and desired of him letters of authority, arrest warrants really, that if he found any of the way, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So, Saul was a real challenge to Jesus. He was going to go out and he was going to arrest the disciples wherever they were. And the way, by the way, it calls them the way here. And the way is the, the sect of Jesus and James. It says so in Acts of the Apostles. And in Acts of the Apostles 24, 14, it says the way is a heresis, a religious heresy. So surprisingly enough, within Acts of the Apostles, it is calling the church of Jesus and James a heresy. Uh, that shows the divide that had already, um, already been formed between simple Judaism and the original Nazarene church of Jesus and James. So Saul became the chief of police in Galilee and in southern Syria, and he was trying to arrest Jesus and his disciples. So how does this fit in with the life of Joseph as Flavius? Because if they were the same person, then Joseph as Flavius would have to be the chief of police in Galilee. But Josephus was just a historian and a chronicler. So how can this story fit in with his life? Surely it has nothing to do with Josephus Flavius. Well, think again, because Josephus Flavius was also the chief of police in Galilee. And it says in his own works, at a mass meeting in the temple of Jerusalem, the high priests appointed additional generals for the army. Both parts of Galilee were assigned to Josephus Flavius, the son of Matthias. Okay. So a new army commander was appointed for the region of Galilee in the AD 60s. And in the Gospels, this army commander was called Saul. And in the works of Josephus, this same army commander was called Josephus, Josephus, Josephus Flavius. You see how similar these two characters are. This is why I've conflated the two and call them Saul Josephus. But we can take this further. Because Saul, as the army commander in command of Galilee. Saul was persecuting Jesus around Galilee. As it says in Acts, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Acts 22, 7. However, Josephus Flavius was also persecuting someone around Galilee at the same time. And who was he persecuting? Jesus, of course. Jesus of Gumala and Sophias. So both Saul and Josephus were the chief of police in Galilee, and both of them were chasing a guy called Jesus. Again, you see these very close similarities between these people. They just have to be one and the same. They just have to be. But this, it changes the story. This is why people have rejected this story, because it changes the story somewhat. Because this new Jesus, the Jesus that was being chased around Galilee by 
sought uh, by um, Josephus Flavius was a very different Jesus to the Gospel Jesus. He was not a carpenter, he was not a poor artisan. He was the governor of Tiberias and he owned a castle in Galilee. And now you can see why Josephus Flavius was sent to destroy the Zodiac at Hamat Tavera. We saw this in the last lecture. Because Saul Josephus, both Saul and Josephus, were the chief of police in Galilee. And they had been sent by the Jerusalem priesthood. This is why I said that the Zodiac was a Nazarene Zodiac, um, a symbol of the Nazarene Galileans, because the biblical Jesus was a Nazarene Galilean, and it was this Jesus, this same Jesus, Jesus of Gamala, who was protecting this Zodiac from Saul Josephus, because this Jesus was a Nazarene. He was Egypto-Judaic. They followed the... Uh, zodiac. It was their primary symbol. And do remember, having gone all through this, of course, and all of these similarities, do remember that we're still talking about the AD 50s and 60s here. Again, we see this chronological chasm. You cannot see this story if you look in the AD 30s. But that's why they relocated it to the AD 30s, because you cannot see this story in the AD 30s. You can only see it if you look in the AD 60s. And I know we saw this graph um, before um, in one of the previous lectures, but I'll show it again, because um, this graph by Lena Einhorn graphically indis indicates this, this chronological chasm. So here we have it again. So we have two groups of similar events which are, are, are denoted by the similar colours in this graph. And you have this group on the top left, which is the biblical group. And all of these similar events happened in the um, AD 30s. And then you have the same sort of group on the bottom right. Now this is within real history, this is within the works of Josephus. But all of those similar events now occur in the AD 50s and 60s. So in the Gospel record it was the AD 30s, in real history all of these events happened in the AD 50s and 60s. As I said before, Rome has moved the chronology and, and we'll see why it was Rome that moved this chronolo chronology later, because they were intimately involved in, in the events of the Gospels. Rome didn't want you to know that Jesus was the leader of the Jewish revolt, which was a revolt against Rome, of course. And so they moved this history back into the AD 30s. And this was a very astute move because it covered up the true his history of the Gospels for 2,000 years. Only now, in my research, has this now come to light. So this is quite a revelation, really. I mean, this, this secret has remained hidden, hidden in plain sight, I might add, but remained hidden for 2,000 years. And only now is it coming to light. And we will take this so much further within the rest of this lecture series because we will go on to explain every facet of the gospel story, its political consequences, and who these people were. And eventually... And I do mean eventually, because this took a long time. This took, this took 20 years before I could find this character. Eventually, we will find the historical Jesus um, in the historical record, find out exactly who he was in the historical record. And this was as much a, a revelation to me as it, as it was to anyone else, because I didn't know about this when I first started this research. It all appeared... Um, and became uncovered as I went through this very intricate research into gospel history. And so you can follow me on that same adventure through that same material as we go through these lectures. You will see how it unfolded. Note also the, um, 
the change in spirit and tenor of the gospel story. If you go to church and you, you, you listen to the priests, you, you will know that the gospels are just all sweetness and light. There is a pauper carpenter, a baby in a manger. There were animals in a stable. The flowing robes of the Jedi priests. Simple followers with a simple apolitical message who were persecuted for no apparent reason. That's the story given to us. But here we can already see the beginnings of a real story about raw power politics. The founder of Christianity, Saul Josephus, persecuting Jesus, destroying rival sects, half killing James, the brother of Jesus, and forming a new Gentile church, which was the total antithesis of the church of Jesus and James. And that church winning out and becoming the dominant church, which we now call Christianity. Note also the political dissembling that went on here. One of the reasons why so Saul Josephus was so disliked by everybody is he was just a he was a vile character, he really was. He was the most egotistical, selfish, ingratiating creep to have ever walked the earth. As he said himself, um, this, is, this is in the epistles, to the Jews I became a Jew to gain the Jews. To the ex-Jews I became ex-Jewish to gain the ex-Jews. To the Gentiles I became a Gentile to gain the Gentiles. And to the weak I became, a weak, I, I became weak in order to gain the weak. I am made all things to all men. That's from 1 Corinthians 9.19. Basically meaning, I will say anything and do anything for money and power. And that money and power came through his new church of simple Judaism, which we call Christianity. But all of this created enemies, of course. I mean, you, you don't become rich and powerful like this, trample on people and have enemies, without creating lots of other enemies. And because of this, Saul was in, arrested and imprisoned for six years. And he had um, trials before Governor Felix, Governor Festus, and King Agrippa, Agrippa II. And in the opinion of Festus, um, Saul was raving mad, which is a nice comment. That comes from Acts 26-24. But despite all of these trials and all of this time in prison, they couldn't decide on guilt or punishment for Saul. And so eventually they packed him off to Rome on a prison ship to go and see Emperor Nero. Again, you see how important and influential these people really were. They didn't have a trial before some local governor in, in Galilee or Tiberias. No, Saul had his trials before Felix, Festus, Agrippa, and then Emperor Nero, the emperor himself. You can see how important these people were. They were not carpet, uh, carpenters and tent makers. They were aristocrats and princes. And that's a good one as well, tent maker. Um, it says in Acts of the Apostles that Saul was a tent maker. They really do take us for fools, don't they? He was not a tent maker. He was a Sukkot maker, the tent of the tabernacles for the festival of Sukkot, the festival of tabernacles. And the largest Sukkot in Judea was made by Queen Helena, who, who became the queen of Judea. And later in these lectures, we will see that Saul Josephus actually worked for Queen Helena. We have that from the Gospel accounts themselves. And so it's quite likely that Saul, Saul Josephus, was the Sukkot maker for Queen Helena. And that's the real story. You see how the, the real story can be twisted into a fairy story by just you know changing the meaning a little bit. <clears throat> 
Sukkot maker becomes a tent maker, as if he's working for some outdoor manufacturer making tents for people climbing Everest or something. No, he was a Sukkot maker. He was a very important person who worked for Queen Helena, who was the Queen of Judea in the AD 50s. So, okay, we've seen here that Saul ended up in jail. What about Josephus? If they are the same person, surely Josephus must have been in jail as well. Well, Josephus doesn't say he went to jail, but he does disappear for six years, and we don't know what he did in those six years. And then Josephus was sent on a prison ship to Rome to see Nero, exactly the same as Saul. And this was because of some priests uh, from the Jeris Jerusalem priesthood who had been, and I quote, charged on some trifling matter. And so Josephus went along with them to plead their case before Nero. Uh, before Nero. He doesn't explain why high priests cannot plead their own case before Nero. And you can bet your bottom dollar that Josephus was also a prisoner on this prison ship exactly the same as Saul was, because it was the same ship. Anyway, this ship sets off and it goes to Cyprus initially, and then it sets off some, from Cyprus and it hits a storm, a three-day storm that hits this ship. And that's probably correct climatically, because if you know anything about the climate of, of the Mediterranean, you get these low pressure systems that run up the Mediterranean, feeding on the heat from the Mediterranean, especially in the autumn, as this was. This was an autumn uh, storm. And they run up the Mediterranean and they stop at the far end and they stick there for three or four days. So the description of this storm that carried on and on for three days is correct. And it's a wonderful tale. Uh, this actually comes from Acts of the Apostles and it's a wonderful tale of a Roman ship caught in a storm. I mean, did you know that Roman ships in this era, this is the first century, of course, carry lifeboats? Well, this one did. And when they heard shoals up a front, they, the, the sailors could hear the shoals uh, of breakers breaking on the shoals in front. And so they lowered the anchors down in front of the boat to try and stop the boat running onto the shoal. It's a real story. This is a first-hand story of a ship caught in a storm. So we can be fairly sure that this is not a fantasy. This is actually a real story of someone caught in a storm. Anyway, this ship is eventually wrecked on a beach in Malta. And they were very lucky because if you've ever been to Malta, you will know that it's just one rocky shoreline from end to end. And it only has a few, very few small beaches. But they managed to come ashore on one of these sand beaches. And this was in the autumn, and they had to overwinter in Malta, uh, and then they went on to Naples the next spring to see Emperor Nero. So here we have Josephus and Saul on the same shipwreck to go and see Emperor Nero. So why do we have these two people on the same shipwreck? Well, because they were the same person. This was not a coincidence. This is a conflation of characters. This is Saul being Josephus, Josephus Flavius. And this makes sense of the Gospel story, if you read the Gospel story with open eyes. Because everything else in the Gospel story revolves around this association between Saul and Josephus. Even when I ended up um, researching Edessa, a place which I didn't even know at the beginning of this um, uh, at the beginning of this research. Even that pointed back to Saul being Josephus. And then when I investigated Arthurian legend, even that pointed back to Saul being Josephus. So the bottom line is that you cannot understand gospel history and you can't understand real first century history unless you know that Saul 
was Josephus Flavius. Interesting. So in summary, we have identified here Saul in the historical record. He was Josephus Flavius. And many people have seen this, but they've turned the page and moved on because of the problems. And those problems include the shift in the timeline, what I call the chronological chasm, the fact that Saul Josephus created Christianity, and the fact that you can identify Jesus in the historical record. And that's a problem because the real Jesus was not a carpenter. He was a real king. And so that became a problem. So you, you cannot identify Saul because if you do, by default, you will identify who the real Jesus was. And so this obfuscation of Saul is a small but a profound deceit that has obscured the history of the true history of Christianity for nearly 2,000 years. So I hope you've enjoyed this interesting new perspective on gospel history, and I hope you can join us for the next Illumination Lecture.